We are very excited uh, for this panel, Reimagining American Democracy and Racial Justice, Civil Rights in the Age of Mass Incarceration, Ferguson, and Black Lives Matter. And we've got um, four presenters. Uh, our first is going to be Ed Dorn, who's a professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs here at UT Austin. And uh, he earned his PhD in political science from Yale University. Uh, prior to earning his PhD, he received an MA from Indiana University. And he is a, oh, he's a, he's a Longhorn, yes. VA from yeah. UT, <laughs> hook him horns. Um, he's a, practice. Yeah, no, I got it, I got it. I love, I, I'm right there. Doran is a former Fulbright scholar having studied in England for his fellowship. He previously worked for the federal government, serving as a political appointee for the US Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in the US Department of Education. In 1993, he was appointed by President Clinton and confirmed by the Senate as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness at the Department of Defense. He was later named the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Re Readiness. Uh, during his role with the Department of Defense, he spearheaded policies governing pay and benefits for military personnel and civilians, along with taking charge of the defense health program, the dependent school systems, and the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute, and the Defense Manpower Data Center. Um, he's authored uh, numerous articles and reports, and he's the former dean of the LBJ School. Um, then we have Lawrence Ralph, and Lawrence Ralph, uh, along with Elizabeth Hinton, was part of our um, group of young uh, dynamic, um, brilliant scholars who've, who've, who've uh, joined us. And he is uh, the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of Anthropology and African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Um, his research is on gangs, disability, um, social, social inequality. And his most recent book is Renegade Dreams, Living Through Injury in Gangland Chicago, uh, which received uh, the C. Wright Mills Award from the Society the study of social problems in 2015. And then we have Elizabeth Hinton. And Elizabeth Hinton has a brand new book that is um, about to come out from Harvard University Press. She is an assistant professor of history and African American studies at Harvard. And her focus is on the persistence of poverty and racial inequality in the 20th century, uh, specifically the transformation of domestic social programs and urban policing after the Civil Rights Movement. Her forthcoming book is From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, and it examines the implementation of national law enforcement programs beginning in the mid-1960s that laid the groundwork for the systematic imprisonment of entire groups of citizens. Um, so very excited for this uh, panel, and we'll start with, with Ed Dorn. Uh, thanks very much. Peniel, and thank all of you for coming. I am mindful of the fact that uh, Elizabeth and Lawrence have come some distance to chat with you and that uh, other than today, you will not have much of an opportunity to engage them. So I'm gonna try to keep my remarks very brief so you'll have a maximum opportunity to, uh, to hear from them. And the way I'm gonna shorten my remarks is to orient them around three ideas. Uh, the first idea is trajectory. The second idea is demographics. And the third is thinking in color. On trajectory, Peniel has given us an opportunity to reflect on this nation's trajectory over the past 50, 60 years since the administration of Lyndon Johnson and the, uh, the passage of three transformative laws, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, the 65 Immigration Reform Act, to today, the presidency of Barack Obama and the incidents that we've heard described on several uh, different panels leading to uh, Black Lives Matter. Whether we consider Black Lives Matter to be a movement or merely 
a series of spontaneous reactions, justified reactions to injustice. We can leave it to others to, to decide. It clearly is an important, someone yesterday used the word moment. That's the past. I'm a policy guy. And in fact, I think I'm the only person on the program who actually has been directly involved in setting policy and uh, having to explain it to not just the general public, but to sometimes skeptical members of Congress. I'm certain that I'm the only person in this room who's ever been, uh, whom a United States senator has ever, ever threatened to put in jail. It was a sobering moment, trust me. When we in policy think about trajectory, uh, we think about the future. I tell my students, Sadie, you may have heard this before, hi there, hey Ben, uh, that we do not solve with policy today's problems. We solve next week's problems, or next month's problems, or the problems that may exist 10, 20 years from now. And so we make a projection. We anticipate where today's issue will be some distance into the future. I'm a native Texan, so I'm going to use an analogy, a metaphor, that Texans understand. Making policy is like hunting ducks. You don't aim at the duck, you aim ahead of the duck. And yes, I know how to aim ahead of a duck. For those of you who are curious, I also know how to sit a horse. In Texas, we don't ride a horse, we sit a horse. Um, that thinking about the future, where we need to go leads inexorably to the idea of demographic change. The last day and a half, we've talked about the mixed effects of the 64 Civil Rights Act, some good things have happened. We've been disappointed by some of the results, including a failure of the huge economic gap between African Americans and white Americans to close as we had hoped. We've talked about the effects of the 65 uh, Voting Rights Act. Barack Obama is clearly one incredible manifestation of the success of that legislation. We haven't talked much about the 65 Immigration Reform Act, but one of the very clear ramifications of that act has been a transformation of the nation's color line. It is very difficult for us to think about the future without starting to think in color, to appreciate the growing diversity of the US population. Our historic narrative may have been in black and white, but in order to move forward, we have to think beyond that binary. And I suspect that thinking beyond the binary, beyond the black-white binary, probably means doing more than simply figuring out how Mexican Americans and Asian Americans and Native Americans sort of can be squeezed within the confines of that binary. I think we're going to have to think a little more broadly than that, a bit more originally than that, and that's very difficult because from birth, we are taught to think 
in binary terms. Mama, Dada, up, down, day, night. And eventually, us and them. We have to have a different conception of both us and them. In Texas, for example, it is very difficult to imagine achieving any kind of progressive policies unless we think beyond the black-white division of things. About coalitions, but I think we have to think also beyond, if you will, the convenience of coalitions. This is a huge, is going to be a huge challenge for us as we move forward. A psychological as well as an intellectual adjustment, but it is something we need to do and we can all start doing it at least by taking a strong moral position on things that we know are outrageous, not just the things that Black Lives Matter was mobilized to confront, although those matters are important. We ought to be mobilized, we ought to be outraged, we ought to shout from our pulpits whenever a presidential candidate talks about a large group of people as rapists and criminals. We ought to be outraged whenever a politician says we're going to keep refugees out of this state. That is one way we can begin, in fact, acting in color even before we learn to think that way. Uh, as they say in the Congress, I will yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Lawrence. That was a great thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to th start by thanking Fennell for inviting me here to the University of Texas to share my thoughts and my work. Uh, Fennell has been a close friend and mentor, really a big brother to me <laughs> for the past five years since I moved to Boston, and he has a really unparalleled ability to bring people together and to address key issues, and I think this conference has been uh, a perfect example of that, so I'm glad to be a part of it. So thinking about what to say this morning on the topic of reimagining American democracy and racial justice, I, I started, about, started to think about the lessons that I learned yesterday. For those of you who missed it, Charlene hunter Gall talked about her conception of synchronicity. Salamisha Tillett talked about a reckoning with America's racial past through song. Stephen Bradley talked about an unfolding of racial uprising in real time. Peniel Joseph, Jeremy Siri, Bob Wilson, and Leah Wright Rigger talked about the legacy of public policy initiatives like the Great Society. And Yehuru Williams talked about Black Lives Matter moments. In sum, many of the participants pushed us to think about American democracy in our time, time, that's what I want to focus on today. I want to talk about how we harness the political potential of what Yuhuru called the Black Lives Matter moment. Now, as an anthropologist, I'm trained to examine the temporal dimensions of social life and cultural life ethnographically, the way that people live in relation to categories of time and by doing so, make those categories socially relevant. Oftentimes, as scholars, we narrate the history of the African American experience according to a progression from slavery to Jim Crow to civil rights to now. When faced with an instance of racial violence in the present moment, 
such as the death of Michael Brown or Trayvon Martin, we draw upon models of time that are both cyclical and linear. What I mean is that each repetition of an assault against a black person necessarily occurs later than the previous ones, making the sequence repetitive, but at the same time, progressive. In this light, our reasoning can be seen as a contemporary version of a very old tradition. Western historiography is rooted in a romantic notion of successive ages. This idea of succession underlies common ways of thinking about genealogies and kinship, diaspora and homeland, the history of social movements and civic organizations, and the legacy of public policies, as we saw yesterday. But even when it comes to the memorialization of material things, families, birth, death, and the legacy of institutions, like the LBJ School, where his face is everywhere you can look on this building. Anthropologists have long pointed out that time is not, nor can it ever be, socially neutral. Time is not everywhere about the duration between birth and death, nor is it always about lifetimes, individuals, monuments, as, or monuments, as many have asserted. Time is also about how people make sense of the present in light of their previous memories and future aspirations. Our relationship to the past is our present day awareness that something happened before this moment. Likewise, our relationship to the future is our state of anticipating what will happen next. In both of these scenarios, the past and the future exist while we're in the present moment. What makes this idea of time relevant to the Black Lives Matter moment that Yehuru talked about is that the present moment becomes an experience that is not merely quantitative, in which people mark time by counting intervals between events, but time is also qualitative. It is a meaningful experience. The distinction between time as a quantitative and qualitative experience reminds me of something the, the last panelist talked about when I was an undergraduate at Georgia Tech and my professor showed us a lynching photo. We didn't know it then, but, early, but in the early 1900s, pictures of lynchings were often used as postcards circulating through our society. In that history class, the professor moved the image out of, removed the image from, from a folder without saying anything to anybody and projected it on the screen. In the photo, a black teenager named Jesse Washington dangled lifeless from a tree. We learned that he was lynched not far from here in Waco, Texas on May 16, 1915, after having been just found guilty of raping a white woman. A long, tense shiver took hold of me, shooting up through my feet from the floor into the processing center of my brain. In that space, at that hour, time wasn't just some abstract conceptual framework that I was using to distinguish between 1915, when the photo was taken, and 2003, when I was confronted by the still eyes of that corpse. Rather, in that moment, I had access to multiple representations of existence at the same time. What I felt then was different from actual violence, but I felt it intensely, just a queasy feeling made of despair, rage, and gnawing resentment. I could feel a glimmer, just a glimmer, of what some tourists visiting the South circa 1950 might have felt when they walked into a store and saw that image perched on a newsstand. Even as an undergraduate, I knew that the death of someone who is devalued in society can spark a variety of responses, sadness, shame, mocking, and mourning. I was the only black person in class that day, and therefore I was also racked with the added anxiety of anticipating the possible responses from my classmates. During the class discussion, I took solace in the fact that other students were likewise sickened by the image of those hundreds in attendance at that lynching. 
One, one student swiftly turned away. The image sickened her, she said. As I later learned, the student's reaction wasn't based on the same feeling I had, as it turns out. She feared that one of the white faces in the crowd might be familiar to her. It could be one of her relatives, she stated. Just then I realized that she and I were in time in qualitatively different ways. My point of telling this story is to make clear that in order to harness the political potential of the Black Lives Matter moment, we must first recognize that American society is made up of a number of conceptions of time that can conflict and or complement with one another. When the police or a vigilante figure like Zimmerman or Dylan Roof kills a person of color, each death becomes a different way of reckoning with time. In these instances, death becomes a reference point by which members of underrepresented groups and or those who have developed a temporal consciousness through which they feel empathy have come to measure racial progress, or rather the lack thereof. For them, the Black Lives Matter moment is not merely about measuring, again, the amount of time between each instance of police violence. It is also qualitative. This violence shapes what it means to be a person of color in America today. What I want to challenge the audience to do is to understand the qualitative dimensions of the Black Lives Matter moment. That is to understand them as meaningful experiences. This requires us to listen to the stories that people tell and how they are telling them. This requires us, this requires that we don't dismiss activism that occurs online and that doesn't necessarily materialize on the streets or in the courtroom. The stories of police violence that people are telling online, so-called hashtag activism, often outpaces the elongated durations of trials, which is purposeful, since many of them have no faith that a trial will bring about either justice or truth. They tell stories of the dead that sensitize the public to the force of their presence, stories that make for long reverberations. These narratives draw together until they form a collective meta-story that bears the weight of an anticipatory death. The people who experience Black Lives Matter moments tell the story of Sandra Bland, a native of suburban Chicago who left her hometown to take a job at her alma mater in Prairie View, Texas. Shortly after moving to the South, Bland was pulled over by the police for failing to signal a lane change. After interrogation by the police officer recorded on police dash cam, in which the officer is seen to be escalating the situation, Bland was then arrested for assaulting a public servant. A second video of the arrest taken by a bystander shows Bland on the concrete with the police officer, st police officer standing above her. Bland repeatedly complains that her head has been slammed into the ground. Days later, Bland is found dead in her jail cell. The police claim that she committed suicide by hanging. Friends, family, and supporters of Bland quickly expressed skepticism about the reports of her death. In the two days following her death, more than 31,000 people tweeted about the instance using the hashtag Sandra Bland. As her name started trending on Twitter, as this event became a Black Lives Matter moment, African Americans began anticipating their own deaths at the hands of cops, discussing what they wanted others to do for them should they suffer the same fate. If I die in police custody, read one post, ask every question and know that I didn't end my own life and protest in the spirit of the founding fathers. If I die in police custody, read another, you have my permission to take to the streets to protest in my name. Never let the world forget what happened to me. Even more trickled in. If I die in police custody, do not apologize on my behalf. Do not forgive. Do not forget. Express your rage to validate my humanity. In this Black Lives Matter moment, those sharing their grief publicly in this way experienced an injustice that does not fit 
the, the temporality of progress, a reckoning with time that, a reckoning with the fact that part of the contemporary experience for many people of color means that you cannot know when you, what's coming next and thus have to prepare for the future or for the worst. On this social media platform, the attempts at reckoning with being pulled over for the offense of driving while black is not assuaged by virtue of the fact that it is a widely shared experience. Instead, it thickens and darkens into accumulating considerations of death. These considerations, these stories, these digital living wills make time. They enter people's moral reserves and help them develop a metabolism for digesting police violence. They implicitly offer advice. Slow down when the blue lights blare in your rear view. Be steady in your jail cell before everything goes blank. Better to plan for such things than to be surprised in the future. So goes the temporal logic. There is an assumption about racial thinking that imagines that we can locate the mainstream social perspective and then position alternate viewpoints as marginal to that standard. But time provides a different standard than this kind of perspective since everyone must orient themselves in relation to its passage. Black Lives Matter moments are about reckoning with time, and time reckoning is about simultaneous temporalities or synchronicity, as Charlene said yesterday. It's about people who cannot help but be habituated to linear time, yet who orient themselves towards the glow of sirens and mark the intervals injustice of injustice by spreading the word of another death. What I'm talking about is similar to W.E.B. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness, the sense that people of color have long had to look at themselves through the eyes of others and measure their souls by the tape of another world. Yet I do not mean to reduce the multiple temporalities at play here to a simple black and white racial binary. Any life, regardless of race, entails multiple and simultaneous temporal engagements that reveal competing priorities. We live in a context in which linear time is about the uncertain and indefinite relationships between the individual lifetime and the enduring public institutions that shape a person's concept of the world. Hence, I argue that if we truly want to ameliorate racial antagonisms, if we actually strive to reimagine American democracy and racial justice, as Peniel, as Peniel challenges us to do, the question then becomes, how can we attune ourselves to life's competing rhythms? Thank you. I just want to commend UT Austin for establishing the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the LBJ School and for bringing in Peniel Joseph as director. Thank you, Peniel, for <laughs> inviting me to come speak at this inaugural conference. It's really an honor to be here and thank all of you for, for coming. So the establishment of this center, and I think this was mentioned by Uhuru earlier this morning, it really could not have come at a more fitting time and a fitting historical moment because we're at this crossroads in America as the proceedings over at the conference over you know, the past two days this morning um, have really made clear. And there's a sort of energy that I feel in this room that we share um, and the issues that the center will address in its work will hopefully help bring us towards the racial inclusion and economic justice that civil rights activists envisioned um, and, that, and that the nation moved closer towards during Johnson's presidency. So I know that we talked about, there was a panel yesterday that kind of dealt with Johnson's legacies. And I think if we're going, going to reimagine American democracy and racial justice, we need to go back to the, to the last time that there really was a concerted effort at the federal level to reimagine um, American democracy and racial justice. So we have to go back to the Johnson administration. So in my work, I draw from White House central files, um, beginning with the, the, the Johnson administration right behind this building, and also the archives of Kennedy, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan, to trace the development of the war on crime uh, from its origins in the war on poverty through the rise of the war on drugs and mass incarceration in the 1980s. And in my forthcoming book, I present the rise of the National Law Enforcement Program at the heart of the federal government's long-term response to the civil rights movement. 
So this afternoon, I thought I'd broadly reflect on the ways in which critical civil rights reforms were effectively negated by the contemporary atrocity of mass incarceration in America, a phenomenon that's distinguished by a rate of imprisonment far above all other industrialized nations and that confines systematically entire targeted groups of citizens. So the question of how the US became a mass incarceration society and how we can undo that problem, I think is perhaps the most important domestic issue facing America today. And as Peniel mentioned earlier, once we start to think about mass incarceration, there's all these other aspects of our social services and public programs that are intertwined with it. Um, and I think that we can then begin to think about how we move into a more egalitarian society. So many of you are probably familiar with at least some of the figures. Um, African Americans went from being roughly one third of the nation, nation's prisoners during the war on poverty to over half of those incarcerated by the 1970s. Today, two thirds of people behind bars are African American and, and Latino. When together, they, cr they comprise about a quarter of the population. In the nation as a whole, one in 31 Americans, so probably about two of us in this room, um, are under some form of penal control. And seven million won't vote in the 2016 election due to a felony conviction. So I could go on and on. I could just spend the, you know, the, the rest of my 15 minute talk listing these figures. Um, but the story of how the US became this prison nation usually begins with the, in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan's ascendance and the rise of conservatism. But the domestic policy shift towards confinement urban surveillance had been firmly established by a bipartisan consensus of national policymakers in the two decades prior to Reagan's presidency. So the sight of armored uh, cars and heavily armed police officers that Uhuru showed on the streets of Ferguson that kind of galvanized the nation and the Black Lives Matter movement had their precedent not in the wars on drugs and terror, um, as many assumed, but in the Law Enforcement Assistance Act that Lyndon Johnson presented to Congress on March 8, 1965. Johnson also sent the Housing and Urban Development Act to Congress that month, which subsidized private homes for low-income renters, and of course, the Voting Rights Act, which gave black Americans in the South the opportunity to participate in the electoral process as full citizens and is considered the major legislative victory of that year. The president himself hoped, however, that 1965 would be remembered not only for this momentous victory, but also as, quote, the year when this country began a thorough, intelligent, and effective war against crime. Johnson's intervention was entirely unprecedented. For the previous two centuries, crime control matters rested squarely under the domain of state and local governments. And now Johnson sought to establish a direct role for the federal government in state uh, and local police operations, court systems, and state prisons for the first time in American history. So thus, the very height of progressive social change in this country coincided with a newly punitive intervention in American cities. And this is one of the most significant ironies of the 20th century. A new era in law, American law enforcement had begun, one that would soon begin to shift the country's egalitarian policy trajectory. Federal policymakers pursued Johnson's regressive policy turn thereafter, opting to deploy militarized police forces in urban neighborhoods and to build more prisons that privilege what liberals and conservatives alike call the forgotten civil right to public safety, instead of seeking to resolve the socioeconomic causes at the root of the problem. So absent from the policy table, table were programs that, would, that could have provided low-income um, and racially mar marginalized Americans a concrete means to access decent shelter, education, and employment. So born from the Johnson administration at the height of the civil rights revolution, the federal government's investment in surveillance and confinement programs has functioned as a central engine of American inequality for the last half century. Indeed, Johnson's turn towards crime control as a national priority remains one of his, if not his primary, in, uh, legacy, even more than many of the great society programs that scholars herald, and rightly so, as his greatest achievements. Common accounts argue that Johnson's decision to suddenly involve the national government in what had previously been a state and local matter had to do with party politics that calls for law and order emerge as kind of a shrewd electoral strategy to retain critical portions of the white uh, electoral in the context of civil rights. Or it is said that rising crime rates in the 1960s and 70s demanded a federal intervention to offset them. 
But contrary to the fear-mongering political rhetoric at the time, uh, Strom Thurmond put it in 1967, no country has ever incurred as much crime as America is enduring today. When Johnson began the war on crime in 1965, violent crime had steadily declined after peaking in the, in the 1920s, and crime levels remained relatively stable since the repeal of Prohibition in 1933. When crime did begin to rise sharply in urban centers, it rose as federal policymakers invested in state and local law enforcement programs that aimed to modernize police departments. Many previously hidden crimes suddenly came to light as reported crime rates determined the extent of national crime control funding. The development of crime statistics technology alongside early law enforcement measures meant that rising crime rates correlated directly to rising crime reporting, a fact that skewed perceptions of violence. For example, the number of recorded robberies and burglaries in New York City increased threefold from 1965 to 1966. Figures that resulted not from an actual upsurge in crime, but from the crime reporting reforms Mayor John Lindsay implemented following the federal government's orders. Nevertheless, the new data and the new policies mutually reinforce one another, deeply shaping domestic policy and encouraging the continual flow of law enforcement resources into low-income African-American communities. Such research furthered what historian Khalil Muhammad has called a statistical discourse about black crime in the popular and political imagination, one that had been alive and well since emancipation and continues to shape crime control policy today. So as an objective, an objective truth and statistically irrefutable fact, policymakers and law enforcement officials cited crime rates to justify the punitive term as a seemingly natural response to a surge in criminality and violence among specific groups of citizens. But in reality, since crime wasn't actually rising when Johnson called the war on crime, and since America was not experiencing more crime in, than anywhere else on the planet ever, as Strom Thurmond suggested, the rise of federal punitive policy over the last 50 years should be understood as the federal government's reaction to the gains of the civil rights movement and the persistent threat of urban rebellion. Urban civil disorder, or what policymakers, journalists, and the public at large called riots, was the new historically distinct type of violence federal policymakers confronted in the 1960s, not street crime. The uprisings were labeled as criminal, even though these in incidents were, were very much rooted in the same grievances shared by the mainstream civil rights movement. After all, the urban unrest that surfaced in the immediate context of the war on poverty and the passage of mon mon monumental civil rights legislation was a response to the presence of exploitive and exclusionary institutions in African-American neighborhoods and usually began after an aggressive encounter between black residents and police. So this is in sharp contrast to the race riots that swept American cities in the post-war period, which had been incited by white hostility to integration. Beginning with the killing of an unarmed 15-year-old um, black teenager by New York City police that sparked the Harlem Uprising in July 1964. This was just two weeks after Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law and as Congress considered the Economic Opportunity Act that would launch the war on poverty. The nation witnessed more than 250 separate incidents of urban civil disorder over the five summers of Johnson's presidency. The violence constituted a prolonged and, and sporadic conflict involving more than 100,000 African-American participants and law enforcement officials, as well as the destruction of billions of dollars worth of property. Taken together, the incidents resulted in the greatest period of domestic bloodshed the nation had experienced si since the Civil War. Indeed, incidents of urban civil disorder during the second half of the 60s brought to the fore the unanswered legacy of emancipation. With more than half of all nine white Americans living in poverty at the time, the uprisings exposed the existing failures of the war on poverty. That landmark federal action had failed to solve structural inequality and disadvantage, and yet ironically became a metaphor that rationalized a further retreat from widespread community, community participation and other more transformative notions of liberal social reform. Thus, Johnson's war on crime emerged both from the urgency created by these urban uprisings and from the way that the president and allied policymakers understood urban citizens' decision to respond to their conditions with violence. So we could also think about the war on poverty as a, manifest a manifestation of, of, of fear about urban civil disorder and the behavior of young people, particularly young African Americans. In fact, the war on poverty and its unprecedented intervention at the federal level created a seedbed for an increasingly punitive orientation in domestic or urban policy. 
So as urban civil disorder only escalated following Johnson's urban uh, punitive intervention, federal policymakers treated anti-poverty policies less as moral imperatives in their own right and more as a means to suppress future rioting and crime. So essentially, the Johnson administration fashioned a new liberal synthesis that brought crime control strategies under the fold of social welfare programs, allowing law enforcement officials to use methods of surveillance that overlapped with social programs. So for instance, anti-delinquency measures framed as equal opportunity initiatives to effectively diffuse crime control strategies into the everyday lives of Americans in segregated and impoverished neighborhoods. And so this is where I kind of differ from. I, I don't see this, this criminalization as a new Jim Crow, um, but instead a historically distinct phenomenon that involves the criminalization of urban social programs. An alternative policy that might have wrestled with the urban crime control practices and racial profiling that set off the uprisings in the first place, or rethinking of the rationale behind la launching a war on poverty without recourse to mass unemployment, deteriorating housing conditions, and failing public schools, did not present itself to the White House and Congress. Instead, due to their own set of assumptions about race and crime, due to their own racism, the bipartisan consensus of federal policymakers designed and supported law enforcement programs that targeted African American men between the ages of 15 and 24 who were seen as primarily responsible for the unrest and who policymakers believed had been influenced by civil rights activists increasingly advocating for self-determination and community control. Without evoking race explicitly, the White House and Congress then built a set of punitive policies that focus on controlling this group of young black men and subsequent generations by expanding the field of surveillance and patrol around them. This process resulted as much from their fears over rising crime rates as from the clearly articulated decision to manage urban crisis with punitive measures thought to stop or deter for future uprisings. So as a reaction to the rising militancy within the civil rights movement, the bipartisan consensus of national policymakers privileged punitive responses to urban problems and began to reframe numerous social ills as matters needing greater attention and intervention from law enforcement. So over time, crime control issues came to dominate government responses to racial inequality. A federal employment drive to create jobs for black men never materialized, but the Johnson administration did effectively support a job creation program for police departments with nearly all white forces. Through the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, which was the last major piece of domestic legislation Johnson signed into law and essentially was the, the capstone um, of his great society, Congress vastly expanded the Office of Law Enforcement Assistance that Johnson created in that when he, when he called the Warm Crime in 65 into the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. The Office of Economic Opportunity at the center of the war on poverty never grew into a larger, more permanent agency of this sort. And although community action, secondary education programs, and housing and urban development far surpassed crime control in terms of the proportion of federal expenditures during the Johnson administration, and Nixon they go up, and we'll see that in a minute, assistance to law enforcement was more sustained and more consistent. Indeed, funding for the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration grew 13-fold during the Nixon administration, from 63 million in 1969 to 870 one million in 1974, and this was the same year that the Office of Economic Opportunity was terminated. Before Ronald Reagan took office, the federal government had allocated nearly 10 billion in taxpayer dollars, or 25 billion in today's dollars, towards the modernization and expansion of the nation's police, prison, and court systems, the carceral state. The states dedicated hundreds of billions of dollars more to criminal justice and law enforcement during the same years, stimulated by the programs national policymakers subsidized and designed. With Democrats in control of Congress and the Johnson administration through the final years of the Carter administration, working across party lines and during and in between political campaigns, that $10 billion went to hiring more police officers in Austin, in Dallas, in Houston, and all other major American cities, as well as enhancing the weapons and surveillance technology at the disposal of law enforcement. That $10 billion went to implementing undercover units, special tactical squads, and sting operations to find people who could potentially commit crime and arrest them, or worse. And in addition to increasing and militarizing urban patrol forces, the federal government led states in enacting harsh and racially biased sentencing laws and endorsed new penal institutions that made mass incarceration possible. 
Although the, jo the Johnson administration had created a blueprint for a national crime control program to improve American society, the long-term impact of the shift towards surveillance and confinement has brought our nation to a turning point that can no longer be ignored. So as we reimagine American democracy and racial justice in the 21st century, we need to more deeply consider the criminalization of urban social programs and the mass incarceration as the late and mass incarceration as the latest development in the evolution of the civil status of black Americans. It's really the foremost civil rights issue of our time. We're in this exciting reform moment. The explosive growth of the American prison system has drained public resources to the point that states can no longer sustain the largest prison system on the planet. And with the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act of 2015 before Congress, this is the kind of most significant criminal justice oppor reform opportunity for a generation. Uh, the need for decarceration is pretty much the only thing that Republicans and Democrats can agree on. It's always been a bipartisan project, so this shouldn't surprise us. And while it's true that President Johnson could not have foreseen the unintended consequences of the path he set in motion and the entirely new threshold of urban surveillance his policy supported, supported what is perhaps the central irony of the late 20th century is that one of the most idealistic enterprises in the history of the United States has left a legacy of more crime, more prisons, and more inequality. So I'm wrapping up, but we study history to take away what worked in the past and what didn't in order to build a better present and future. And we still have much to learn from our forebears. We can resolve to study the, the root cause and the solution of, of pressing issues, which is exactly what the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy is all about and what this conference is about. And in doing so, we can begin to envision, reimagine, and build towards change. And this is precisely what grounded the vision of the work of Gloria Richardson, Huey Newton, Fannie Lou Hamer, Stokely Carmichael, and countless others who fought for social justice throughout her, our history, who didn't patiently wait for the government um, to do something to, for the government to treat them like human beings. And I think they're, they leave us with a legacy that matters now, perhaps more than ever, as we move forward. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna um, try to <laughs> synthesize some of this. Um, um, these, are great, these are great talks. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk about, and I think it connects in a way with what Ed started with um, uh, thinking in color, acting in color, and also with Lawrence and the whole notion of um, time and empathy and, and how we sort of qualitatively, our time has been transformed by these um, public spectacles of black death. Um, and I think our time has also been transformed by uh, the protests and the social upheaval and disruption we've been seeing. I think it's interesting for us who study this to um, see it unfold uh, over the last um, 24 months or so. And certainly um, at the LBJ School, that, that, that critique, um, which I think was nuanced, um, and we've got LBJ scholars in here uh, who, who, who've studied um, that administration uh, for their whole lives, that one of the unintended consequences of this legislation um, is, is sort of turning the criminal justice system, which even pre-1965, African Americans have always had a, a star-crossed relationship with the criminal justice system um, by virtue of their um, legal status as, as enslaved uh, property uh, during the antebellum period. Um, but that became exponentially worse um, during this period. And I think what's interesting is that you say you don't think of it as a new Jim Crow, and I think in the Q&A I'd like to you know, talk about that as well. But what I wanted to talk about in terms of reimagining American democracy is really, and it's interesting, if I don't, I don't know if any of my students in my civil rights and public policy class are here, but we've been looking at um, you know, Ira Katz-Nelson, um, uh, when affirmative action was white, looking at a history of public policy that predates the heroic period of the civil rights movement where we get two-tiered liberalism during the New Deal, one for blacks, one for whites. Um, um, we've looked at Nancy McLean's book, which looks at um, really a, a, a labor and feminist history of the civil rights era uh, to try to upend um, workplace uh, discrimination. And it also looks at Mexican Americans and their fight um, to upend uh, job discrimination. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, this issue of black equality. Because I think one of the things that's happened in the 21st century is that 
we really um, have lost that. Uh, we talk about diversity, we talk about multiculturalism, and I think that even in the context, at risk of sounding like um, I'm advocating some kind of hierarchy of oppressions, because sometimes people will say, well, now everybody's got problems, you know what I mean? Like, my, my people were immigrants, we came from Ellis Island, and it was very difficult. Um, and, you know, uh, that's not quite the same as slavery, but I understand that those people had harsh problems, and I, I don't want to discount them. The reason I, I talk about black equality is that the, the, I think one of the, the interesting aspects of studying American history um, is the way in which race contours uh, all of that history, but the idea of um, blackness is the core of that history because of antebellum slavery. And it's kind of like you have to continue to articulate that and articulate it because we still haven't come to terms with racial slavery. Um, even the President of the United States, when he was a senator, in the context of the Jeremiah Wright controversy, and that was the pastor who Fox News was showing clips saying, God damn America, uh, throughout the uh, spring, late winter and spring of 2008. Uh, it was crippling his campaign, and on March 18th, 2008, Philadelphia, at the Constitutional Hall, uh, surrounded by American flags, Barack Obama gave his famous race speech, which saved his candidacy. But I think um, easily one of the most interesting and important parts of that entire speech is the fact that even as that speech was hailed as one of the best speeches on race ever, not by me, um, was the fact that Obama in that speech made a moral equivalency between antebellum slavery and white resentment over affirmative action and over black grievances. And people loved it. Um, as, as a scholar um, and as somebody who studied this period, um, I didn't. And the reason I didn't is because there is no moral equivalency between racial slavery and white resentment over perceived unjustified African-American grievances over racial slavery and Jim Crow. But that, that leads me to my notion of black equality. Um, in the context of the post-war period, uh, black equality, uh, African-American activists make black equality synonymous with transforming American democracy, and they do this through the double V campaign. The idea that victory against fascism abroad had to be connected with victory against anti-black racism domestically. But here's the caveat. And we can go back to Frederick Douglass and Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells, and people were basically saying the same thing. The caveat was that black equality would be a common denominator for a much more expansive vision of American democracy. That would include the idea that Ed was talking about, about thinking and acting in color. The caveat was that if you could get to this thing called black equality, and we can, I'll talk in a second about how, how we get there. If you could get to that, there'd be reverberations for everyone. And just in terms of policy, our biggest example is Title VII and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, where even though people talk about Title VII as an afterthought, but the very fact that gender um, um, discrimination is included in the Civil Rights Act, and then in 1972, and in Title IX, uh, the civil rights movement um, has impacted people of color, it's impacted women, it's impacted people with um, physical disabilities, and certainly there is a huge connection between the civil rights movement, even though there's some tension and movements for um, marriage equality and LGBT movements. And most of that tension is around class. Some of it is around homophobia, but some of it's around class, just like tensions between African Americans and feminist movements. Uh, mainstream feminism, um, that's been a tension around class. Uh, sometimes there's um, um, sexism and, and obviously patriarchy, misogyny by certain segments and strata of the black movement, but it's really been about class. Who do we define as women um, who are citizens of this country? Um, um, are, are poor black women included in that, uh, both in a political and policy manner? But the core of what I'll talk about I know there's only a few minutes and then we'll open this up. This idea of black equality, what would that mean? 
Well, there's a great book for the students in here, uh, Monique Morris's Black Stats, which gives us, um, up until 2014, the social economic indicators uh, of how African Americans are doing. Everything from black women and rates of breast cancer to African American access to uh, Fortune 500 companies, um, to rates of crime, death penalty, uh, residential segregation, homeowner access, um, health care and mental illness disparities, uh, the proximity of black children to environmental toxic waste dumps, including we've got an asthma crisis in the black community, and we had one in the 1960s, and the 1970s, and the 1980s, the 1990s, and the aughts, and it continues. Uh, it, it gives us some stats about um, access to healthy foods. I grew up in a neighborhood where there was no organic, fresh fruit, vegetables in Southside Jamaica, Queens. Um, there was no yoga centers or yoga mats. Uh, my mom didn't go to spas. Um, it was a whole other different way of, of living and life. And the first time I saw those fresh fruits and vegetables was in uh, Long Island um, um, when I went to college. And uh, it was a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, there weren't uh, African Americans in the neighborhood, but the supermarket was um, extraordinary. And I didn't quite get what was going on um, until having a discussion with my mother about why supermarkets like that weren't in our, our neighborhood, our community. So this idea of black equality and what it means is connected to racial outcomes and disparate outcomes. How would uh, a, a, a non-racist American society look? Well, we would see it vis-a-vis -vis outcomes. We would see it vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, employment figures, the number of African Americans who are being arrested. We would see it in terms of sentencing rates. We would see it vis-a-vis -vis access to wealth. Uh, we would see it in the professoriate and the number of students at places like UT, the number of tenured professors, the number of, of African American faculty at a place like the LBJ School. That would be our indicators, right? Doesn't mean it would end poverty. Doesn't mean it would end sexism. All those things are both intertwined, but we need specific strategies for all of them. But what I would challenge us, and I'll close in terms of thinking about reimagining re American democracy, is to really put back on the front burner this idea of black equality and why um, black folks who've historically been uh, at the lowest uh, rung of America's social, political, economic, cultural uh, hierarchy, why it's so important to very explicitly talk and discuss and advocate for black equality, and not just diversity, and, and not to just say that you're diverse because you have every other group but a black person in there, and it's very diverse. I've seen that in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they tell me, this place is going to be so diverse and you ask, where are the black people? And they say, not that kind of diversity. Not that kind of diversity. It's, it's this, come on now. It's this other kind of diversity. So it's, you know, Asia is cool, the whole continent, Pakistan, India, um, Europe, um, sometimes Latin America, sometimes not. Sometimes South America, sometimes not. But sometimes South Americans define themselves as white, and they're cool, especially if they can pass. Um, the Caribbean sometimes is even cool because uh, I've had folks tell me that people from the Caribbean, and I'm, I'm Haitian and very proud, but I'm also black American, um, the Caribbeans are not like those black Americans, um, that West Africans are not like those black Americans. That the new thing in the 21st century is showing the Nigerian 18-year-old who's not like the hip-hop thugs and got accepted to the whole Ivy League spectrum, right? And th those things go viral. Look at this, this Nigerian kid, he, he is brilliant and beautiful, not like those complaining, parasitic black thugs. Brandon Terry was talking about the, the, the notion of parasitic and, and debtor citizenship, and it's related certainly to black women, but, but black men too, because black men right now, statistically, empirically, and black boys are doing much worse than their counterparts in terms of gaining access, especially higher education, especially college degrees, um, in the STEM, in, in, every single, in every single field, and that's connected to my brother's keeper, the Obama administration's efforts to do something about that, even though that's 
private money, $200 million. It's a drop in the bucket, but he claims that he's going to, um, or the claim is that he's going to spend his post-presidency uh, 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 trying to pursue, pursue that uh, for, for African-American boys. So I'll, I'll close by just saying that this idea of black equality should be on the front burner. It should not be something that's tangential. But while saying that, my argument, and we've seen it through Civil Rights Acts, Voting Rights Act, the Brown decision, once you do pursue black equality historically in the United States and you have successes, many other groups, not just people of color, but women and on the margins, benefit from that pursuit, okay? And some continue to be allies, some opportunistically uh, uh, rode the civil rights wave and coattail until it was no longer opportunistic and then divorced themselves from that movement. But historically, when we push for black equality, and why is black equality so important? Because black people are human beings. A struggle for black equality is actually universal. And I'll close with this story. Bayard Rustin and Stokely Carmichael, they're at a debate at Hunter College in New York City in December of 1966. Bayard Rustin is one of the most important figures of the post-New Deal era, uh, the radical social democratic activist, openly gay, organizer of the March on Washington, a mentor to Martin Luther King Jr., um, a disciple of Gandhi, a, a global cosmopolitan thinker, um, a man who was um, of his time, uh, but the times didn't know it yet. Uh, and when we think about Bayard Rustin and Stokely, Stokely had been mentored by Bayard Rustin. Stokely had been a teenager and organizing in uh, Harlem, uh, organizing garment workers. And they have a debate in 1966 over the use of the word black power. Stokely had, of course, unleashed that term June 16, 1966. And Bayard Rustin tells him that black power is going to disallow for the coalition politics that the movement needs, that black power is not something that is universal enough. It's too specific. It's something that's going to separate people. And Stokely tells him that black power is universal, Bayard, but it's universal in black. And get your mind around that. Wrap your mind around that. That just because something is black does not mean not only is it bad, but it cannot be a common denominator for our univer universality and for our collective humanity. And we do that in scholarship all the time, in higher education. We don't want to touch the black stuff, even black people, right? So when we think about reimagining American democracy, and I know the president can't say it, but we're not all running for president in this room, are we? So just because he can't say it or she can't say it, we have to be the ones who are willing to courageously, including our white allies, including our Latino allies, to talk about black equality, to push and pursue that concept. And how would American democracy look if we believed in black equality, right? And to then watch these different reverberations unfold, including for LGBT communities, including for Latino communities, including for Native American and Asian American communities, including for um, the millions of white people who are actually poor and under a debilitating economic injustice in this country, but who continue to hold on to white privilege as if they abandoned white privilege, they would suffocate and die at the instant that they did it. Including that, right? It will reverberate nationally. But the thing is, we have to, just like say her name, be courageous enough to say it, black equality. I always do. I always will continue to, but I invite everyone else to join me. Thank you. So we're going to do some. We're going to do. We're going to do some some questions. Um, and I do. People have questions. Raise your hand, please. Because if not, I've got a bunch for this. <laughs> questions. Questions. Does anybody have a Okay, yes. All right. So. All right. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for a really great session. Um, really, really great way to sort of continue this discussion. And what, so one of the questions I had, and I think it, it pertains most to your talk, Dr. Hindu, but I think I would be interested in what all of you think about this. Are you familiar with um, the new book that had come out by Michael Javen 
Is it Fortner? Fortner, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm teaching yeah. that. I'm teaching oh, you are? Okay, okay, good. So the, so the black, it's, it's, it's called the black silent majority, yeah. right? This is yeah, where yeah. he sort of makes this argument, right, that a lot of the issues around mass incarceration have stemmed from sort of black folks' own kind of efforts to demand justice in the community. He uses New York and Harlem, certainly Brooklyn, as, as um, the locus of a lot of his arguments. So I would be interested to hear sort of your, your take on this work and, and how your critiques thereof and what all else. So thank you. You well, go, go ahead. I Anna. have a lot. I mean, I, I obviously, you know, I, I have a lot to say about, about the book. Um, without getting into specifics, on a broader level, I think that, you know, it's certainly true that people want their communities to be safe. Yeah. And that when you're living in a community where your property is vulnerable to robbery, where you're, where there are drug addicts who are, you know, holding you up at gunpoint, yeah. where your kids' lives are vulnerable by your na by, due, due to your neighbors, you're going to, um, to, to, to call for police protection. That's what police are, are supposed to do. Part of what, um, and, and African Americans have always, you know, support, asked for and called for police protection. Yeah. Um, part of, part, and, and this goes to kind of the larger transition um, of the decline and retrenchment from social services um, and the welfare state is that the problem is that African Americans in Harlem, he focuses mostly on, on Harlem and elsewhere, we're calling for a bunch of things at that time. They weren't just calling for police protection. When they were calling for police protection, they were calling for things like grievance boards so that their grievances would be met. They were calling for things like um, tenant and community patrols so that they were actually involved with, with the policing themselves, similar to things that the Panthers were calling for. Um, so it was, it was a more nuanced and, and kind of systemic critique of, OK, these are, these are the problems going on in our community. And they were also well aware of the fact um, many of the activists that Fordner himself look, looked at, that police were responsible for keeping drug markets in certain areas, in targeted communities, in, in Harlem itself. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated than that. And for me, that story is more about um, the decline of basic public services in, in low-income, segregated urban communities. So I'm interested to hear. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, you know I think it's a very interesting book. It's an important book. I mean, I disagree with his 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 policy conclusions and his his um, his his. It's a selective history, but, but my students are going to read it because I want them to read it alongside me, Jim Crow, and and some other stuff. Um, I think what he's saying basically the argument, and and I agree with Elizabeth that it becomes too narrow. Um, and and this goes back to you know when when Brandon was talking about violence during his talk. Part of what, what I think we activists did in the 60s, but the state and policymakers and politicians didn't. What are the roots of violence? Why are poor black neighborhoods, when you concentrate a ton of people in projects like Queens Bridge projects or Cabrini Green projects, why is there all this behavior that is bad behavior? Now, I won't say it's pathological. And the reason I won't say it's pathological is because that term has been applied to black communities in a racist manner. And they don't apply the term pathology to the architects of the 2008 financial crisis. <coughs> that behavior was also pathological, mm -hmm. but they won't say it. Right. The reason why is they're using pathology to dehumanize African American people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do it to dehumanize other people of color too, of course. But what you are going to get is bad behavior. Now, are the roots of that bad behavior genetic? Are they somehow just prone to violence and drug abuse? Or is this a concentration of poor people in places like Harlem that, look, 50 years later, Harlem gets such an infusion of resources uh, like Charlene hunter Galt was saying, Maya Angelou's brownstone just been sold for $5 million. 50 years ago, it wasn't worth $5 million. So the, the, the problem in terms of violence in black communities, and same thing with Chicago right now, and Lawrence is an expert on Chicago. I'd love to hear his perspective. It's not that these communities are somehow programmed to violence. It's what's going on when they lack the resources, the education. You know, So these communities, it's not. Hyde Park, 
Austin. It's not, it's not Rose, Rosedale, Austin, right? The reason why there's not gang violence in Hyde Park and Rosedale is because these communities have resources. Mm -hmm. They have resources. They have tons of financial resources and community-wide resources where the police interact with these communities in much different ways than they do in poor communities with concentrations of poverty, right? And so the problem with, with, with the, the disagreement I have with Fortner is that yes, there was a black middle class that wanted an end to the crime, sort of by any means necessary. But there was also community activists. Yeah. There were people who were part of the community action program in Harlem, which is part of Johnson's legacy too. That's why mm -hmm. it is a, um, uh, a complicated legacy because at the same time that you've got that crime bill, you also have tools to try to um, um, fight poverty and to try to lift people up and have um, community action programs and boards, 30% of them being represented by the poor. Um, you've got so many different, you know, Head Start is coming from that. You've got so many different um, um, innovations there, but what Fortner argues is that it's sort of the black people themselves who became the architects mm -hmm. of the Rockefeller laws and all this ever punitive public policy against African Americans. And there I'd say I, I disagree with that. And, and just, the, just to add to that, yeah. and thinking about the theme of the conference too, I mean the question then is why is it, if, if, if we take his argument, you know, if, if black people themselves are the architects um, of the Rockefeller drug laws, why is it that the only demands then that black people make, that the state actually meets, are the punitive, they're, yeah. you know, like black people are demanding all kinds of things. They demand, they're demanding education, they're demanding resources. And what does the state do? It, okay, we'll, we'll give you ask for more police, we'll do that. You wanna put people in prison forever? We'll do that. And that's, histor and that's been the, the case historically, and I think that is the really interesting question that his work shows that escapes him. Yeah, um, yeah no, I agree with that. My name is Valerie. Um, I was wondering how you feel about the abrogation by states um, for criminal justice and corrections and the uh, uh, privatization um, and their um, and its influence and effect on black uh, inmates specifically, not any inmates, but especially in black inmates. I, I'll be brief. Mm -hmm. It's perverse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Punishment should not be for Lawrence? profit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a fundamental problem in um, how we address solutions, and um, I think a lot of these solutions that people have been circling around um, that that we've been kind of taking issue with are kind of based on underlying values, and it goes back to the last question. Um, what do you believe, um, it's kind of like the fiction of personal responsibility, right? So if you believe that people are criminals because of choices, individual choices that they made, that gives a kind of leeway uh, to enact all kinds of policies on them and uh, criminalize behaviors in, in a certain kind of way and ignore the structural context that produces inequality and produces the dispor disproportionate crime rates and that motivates certain policies rather than others. Uh, and it also provides a kind of window into, it has provided a kind of window into the privatization of, um, not only incarceration, but um, all kinds of um, socioeconomic markers of, 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 of poverty, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the privatization of communities and, and blocks through um, kind of tax increment financing, which transforms neighborhoods and and, and forces people to move out because they can't then afford um, the housing in their in their previous locations, um, and it also is it, the two issues are related because um, 
you know, these are the communities in which people cycle in and out of prison, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think addressing the underlying mm -hmm. question about um, what values are, and assumptions are motivating um, particular policies and particular sorts of economic interventions uh, addresses uh, things like the, the kind of privatization issue. Because if you believe that uh, a person had a moral failure, they failed themselves, and that's why they're, incarceration, they're, they're incarcerated, um, you approach that problem in a different way than if you believe that we as a society have failed populations of people. And so we as a society need to address how we're going to deal with that problem. Then it doesn't lend itself as easily to a kind of privatization solution in that instance. Let me expand on perverse. It is perverse to attach a profit incentive to the denial of human rights. Yeah. One thing I'll add is that what's interesting is so um, Barack Obama um, and, and the Justice Department, they did a six-month study and they announced that they're no longer going to um, have solitary confinement for juveniles. Another thing that's happened um, last year, on, there was, earlier this year or late last year, there was one day where they released 6,700 um, uh, nonviolent drug offenders, the biggest one-day release in, in the history of um, the federal prison system. So, so there, there is some takes, uh, some efforts, hard-won efforts to ameliorate this. But one thing I'll say, and, and, and I've taken this from, from, from Brandon's work too, is that um, when we think about the civil rights movement, um, and this is, uh, you know, and I, you know, he, he, even here at the LBJ School, I, I think I've had disagreements with people, like how do we define sort of racial progress since 65, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because I think part of it is the way in which um, we think about it is that these sets of laws finally provided full citizenship rights for African Americans. And that, unfortunately, is erroneous, um, especially when you skew for class. And then in the ensuing 50 years, there's going to be whole classes of people who were poor in the 1960s but now they are poor, um, incarcerated. Um, now they are marginalized even more. So not everyone, not everyone, but, but large swaths of the 42 million African Americans, 28% below the poverty line, 40% of children living in poverty, 35% living right above the poverty line, part of the working poor. So even if we today were to end mass incarceration, and, and Jim Foreman Jr. says that if we um, released all the nonviolent drug offenders, um, we'd still have 1.5 million people in prison. So we then would have to have a discussion of how much, what, what kind of punishment um, suffices for people who actually did commit violent crimes, right? Because there'd still be a million and a half of them in prison, right? But then, even if we, we let go of everyone in prison, the idea that somehow African Americans now suddenly have citizenship rights, full citizenship rights, uh, is not true. It's another fiction, you know? So the idea that the person who's just let go, let out of prison, is going to be able to have quality child care, is going to be able to have quality mental and physical care, is going to be able to have uh, uh, employment opportunities at a living wage and more. Because remember, we all want more, so why wouldn't other people want more, right? So do you all want to get these great degrees just to say, yeah, I'm cool with this salary, or do you want more and more and more, right? So they're not going to get that access. So the, the reason why I've made arguments and people say, well, where's, where's the data for that? That things have gotten worse for large sectors of the African American community now in 2016 to 1965 is because of the folks I'm talking about. So if you're talking about people who are incarcerated and unemployed, right, things have gotten worse. So we're not talking about, and, and earlier today people were talking about Beyonce and Jay-Z. We're not talking about them. You know, we're not talking about them. 
We're not, we're, we're, we're not talking about Things are better for them. They're making much more money and access now than they would have been able to in 1965, however popular they were. Um, we're not talking about Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. We're not talking about Sasha and Malia. They're going to be fine. And so when people say, oh, Sasha and Malia shouldn't have affirmative action, I, I didn't say they should. <laughs> why, why, why? You know, their, their father was president of the United States. Right. I think they're going to be fine. Um, so, we're so, fine too. You, you know, I mean, so, so the big problem we're facing, though, is how do we define citizenship? Because we've already, we've already erroneously done a narrative of the civil rights movement where citizenship is gained through Brown, through the Voting Rights Act, through the Civil Rights Act, and Open Housing Act, even though, even though we understand those things were not enforced to the full capability that they should have been. Now we have all these different policies in the ensuing 50 years that have been even more deleterious to large strands of the African American community. If you look at uh, black civil society, there's over 20 million people who are in major trouble when you look at the data. Over 20 million. That's, that's why it's catastrophic. It's over, over 20 million are in super trouble when it comes to education, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to the environment they live in, whether they have child care, whether they, their kids can get good and healthy and quality food, all the stuff that people who are citizens in this country take for granted. That's the whole thing. There's a bunch of people here who are biking around Speedway, uh, they, they, they love um, their soy lattes. They'll only eat organic. Hey, I'm down too. But we're not asking, what does that mean if citizenship for us, because we can purchase it, and this goes back to what you were saying, Brandon was talking about the debtor relationship, and if other people, not only can they not purchase citizenship, they're being super exploited and marginalized primarily because of their race and class. So does letting them out of prison somehow end that, and now they're citizens when they have to check the box? There's no hope for employment. There's no access to childcare. Remember, we call all these people monsters and parasites, but they have kids too. So we love our kids, but we can't stand their kids. They've got parents and uncles. Some of them are HIV positive and need meds. They, we, we see our therapist, and we love it, but we don't want anybody else to see a therapist and get mental health, right? Right? So it's cool for, for, for us, right? And so these are all the things we have to think about in terms of citizenship. So it goes beyond just ending the carceral state. We have to have a structural transformation of then what is the state going to do for all of our citizens, but also these citizens whose rights have been so marginalized because we perceived of them as threats, including juveniles. I mean, we're going to bring Brian Stevenson here um, to the center, and, and who's done the Just Mercy best-selling book about juvenile incarceration, and who has the Equal Justice Initiative, who's been working for the last 34 years on juvenile imprisonment and incarceration. Um, until we can understand all that, we're never going to make the country whole. You know? And again, since we don't care about black people, which is why I'm pushing for black equality, that's how that catastrophe can happen. It's because we actually don't care about black lives. So this movement for black lives is so important, and it connects to policy, because we don't let this happen to portions of the polity who we care about. We just don't let it happen. right? It's a catastrophe. And if we were jailing young white people at the same rates that we were jailing African Americans, we would stop on a dime, and it would not stand. That's the problematic that we're facing, right? And we've got to at least acknowledge that. Doesn't it feel good to tell the truth? <laughs> All right. That's it. We're going to close down for now. We're going to close down. We're going to drop the mic. <laughs>